Julie, and good afternoon. Take away my factories, someone once said, and I'll build a new and better factory. But take away my people, and grass will grow on the factory floor. Come on, who said that? Was that some bleeding heart social humanitarian do-gooder who never really had to make a payroll? No. Those are the words of Andrew Carnegie, the immigrant industrialist, a capitalist with a capital C, a man whose bank account in today's dollars would stir envy in the heart of Bill Gates, not to mention John Kohler. <laughs> and yet here he was talking about the value of people to his steel business, just like the value of people to your men's haircut business. And so I want to be very clear about the premise of this presentation today, and that is very simply this, that creating a focused, engaged, and capably led workforce is one of the best things you can do for your bottom line. Creating a focused, engaged and capably led workforce is one of the best things you can do for your bottom line. This is a business issue. Creating a great workplace to some may be a social or a moral issue, but more to the point, it's the profitable thing to do. And I have some numbers to back it up. And so, you know, a, a few years ago, I established a personal goal to visit all 50 states before I turned 50. I was successful in that endeavor, and I know what you're thinking. <laughs> he can't be 50. <laughs> not with that hair. And I'm not anymore. But before I turned 50, I did have the opportunity to visit all 50 states. And so one of those states, naturally, was the state of Nebraska. And I have a picture to prove it. And, do we have anybody in here from Nebraska? Any Nebraskans in the audience? I would have thought so, yeah. I, think, I love Nebraska. I really do. And I especially love the people of Nebraska. Uh, but here's the thing. My wife took this picture of me standing on the state line between South Dakota and Nebraska. You'll notice the sign says, Nebraska, home of Arbor Day. I don't know about you, but I don't buy it. If you're going to put a sign on your state line that says home of Arbor Day, I'm going to be looking for some trees. If you're going to say that yours is a great place to work, people are going to be looking for the evidence. And yet organizations all over America today go around saying our employees are our most valuable asset. Oh, gag me with an annual report. I mean, seriously, take a look at any big company's annual report. And you'll see it right there on like the third or fourth page. It'll be a picture of a smiling employee or an actor portraying one with the words underneath that say our employees are our most valuable asset. And yet the reality is not always the same as that claim. A few years ago, I uh, went to speak for a large hotel chain, for the management of a large hotel chain, and the conference was being held at one of their premier properties. This is a company that told me for months and months before I appeared to, to, to speak that this was a great company to work for, and they really took great pride in what a great organization they were to work for. I drove into the parking lot of this premier property and was greeted by this sign, That's a real sign. I didn't, I didn't like Photoshop that. That's a real sign. I just want to, I want you to ask yourself. We can say that we're a great place to work here at Sport Clips for people to come and learn and grow and develop. But if the reality when people get there is something closer to that, that, that says this is what we really think of people, it's going to be very hard for people to see that as evidence. But here's the thing. All of those companies that Gordon spoke about earlier that he had on the screen as your competitors for haircuts are not only competitors for haircuts, they're competitors for talent. If they see the people picture, as you saw on the personnel department sign, but you do better than that, you're going to win that game every time. Your reputation as an employer is one of the most powerful tools you have 
in recruiting. It's one of the most powerful recruiting tools you have or will ever have, but let's be very clear. While reputation recruits, leadership retains. Reputation recruits, but leadership retains. And I define leadership very simply as the earned consent of followers. The earned consent of followers. And so I'm going to give you a number of assignments today. I know you've already got a lot to do, and this clown's coming up here and give you more to do on your to-do list. And yes, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I want to give you some very specific things to go back to your areas, to take back to your stores, to put in place, to implement, that I believe, because I've seen it happen with other organizations, that will have a positive and compelling impact on your ability not only to recruit the very best talent, but also to keep them and to keep them engaged, working for you and building a profit for your business for a long time to come. Does that sound of interest to anyone? All right, well, so here's your first assignment. Your first assignment says to make leadership a primary qualification for every manager in every one of your stores. Make leadership a primary, not a secondary or a kind of a peripheral, uh, something we may think about later, but it's got to be a primary qualification for anyone who takes on the mantle of leadership and management in one of your stores. In our society, in our culture, how do people generally get promoted from uh, an individual contributor for a not, from a team member position to a management position? It generally happens in one of two ways. First, they have demonstrated extreme proficiency in some technical skill. They are very, very good at being an accountant. They are a very, very good teacher. They do an excellent job of cutting hair. And then we make this illogical leap that says, because you've been excellent at cutting hair, you must naturally be a great leader of people who are going to cut hair. And it's just an illogical leap. The second way that we sometimes promote people into management positions is if their last name is spelled exactly like the name on the building. Now, neither one of those is a good way to, get, to populate our leadership ranks. And so the companies that I've studied over the last 20 years or so that have done the best through their people strategy, say anybody who's going to have the title and the authority and the position of manager must be very good at whatever it is they're managing, but they also must be an outstanding leader. Remember what I said earlier, reputation recruits, but what retains? Leadership. The companies that we've studied that have this as their standard, they're not saying if you're not a good leader, you're not a good person. They're not saying that at all. They're saying if you're not a good leader, you're not going to be someone's boss until you are a good leader. So my encouragement to you, make sure that anybody in a management position are first and foremost excellent leaders. Your job as an area director, as a team leader, one of the most important things you do when it comes to recruiting and retention is to hire and promote managers for whom stylists want to work. It's as simple as that. Hire people who are good leaders. Promote people who are good leaders. Julie told you I've written a few books with the phrase contented cows in the title. First book came out in 1998 and it was entitled Contented Cows Give Better Milk. I'm going to be very clear from the very beginning, nothing that I have ever written about or that will ever talk about has anything to do whatsoever with cows. Can we just have a clear understanding on that right now? Nothing whatsoever to do with cows. I am not comparing your team members to cows, all right? I'm not saying that they look like cows, that they act like cows, that they smell like cows, that they have any other unflattering bovine characteristics, but I am saying that in the same way that contented cows do give better milk, and that's been pretty well scientifically established, satisfied, engaged team leaders give better performances and they stick around a lot longer. Contented cows give better milk. Now, people say, where'd you get the actual two words, contented cows? We got it from carnation milk. If you, if you go to the store and buy a, carna, a can of carnation milk, you'll see on the label it still says, from contented cows. So we use that phrase, contented cows, with the express written consent of the Nestle Corporation, which now owns carnation. 
and which requires me to say this in every presentation that I make. Uh, but no, we've got a great relationship with Nestle and have done some of their leadership training as well. That's all we're saying. Contented cows give better milk, satisfied, engaged team members give better performances, and they stay around longer. So the new book came out just last year, makes the same business case, but with all new, new uh, companies, new illustrations, new examples. It's called Contented Cows Still uh, Give Better Milk. Uh, I'll be in the, in the supplier fair later today and maybe some tomorrow. Got a few copies of those if anybody would like to get one. I would love to talk with you. I'd love to talk with you anyway, whether you want to get a book or not. But that's where I'll be and that's where those will be. That's all we're saying. Contented cows give better milk. Uh, let me, uh, I, I'm going to tell you in a few minutes a, a little bit why I believe that contented cows give such better milk. Um, but I would invite you to go also to our website if you want to learn more about kind of how we did our research. Uh, the contented, the uh, website is contentedcows.com. We have a free newsletter, a free leadership newsletter that you can subscribe to. It comes out each month. Uh, it's called Fresh Milk. Uh, there'll be some other things that might be of value to you on the site. It's Contented Cows. Dot com. I have to emphasize the S on the end of Contented Cows because there is a website out there called ContentedCow.com. And it's a, it's a wonderful website. It's just that it's for a pub in Minnesota. So it's going to give you a little bit different uh, set of, uh, of information. Go to ContentedCows.com. I will also tell you that today I am going to give you a number of assignments. I'm going to give you some bullet point kinds of things. And I love when I see people in that audience taking notes. But I also, for, for you, I have prepared just a short as about a four-page summary of what we've talked about today, and it can be downloaded from our website. Let me just invite you to go to, this will be easy for you to remember, contentedcows.com slash sportclips. Contentedcows.com slash sportclips, and you will see a page there, and you can download uh, the information from today's presentation. Very quickly, here's what we did. We looked at companies that have a reputation for being an employer of choice. We looked at their financials between 2001 and 2010, and we compared their financial performance to the economy as a whole. I have 47 beautiful slides full of graphs and charts and numbers and all kinds of things that very clearly and compellingly make the case that organizations with a strategy around employee engagement and leadership recruit better, retain better, and engage better than their competitors. As a kindness to you today, I'm going to spare you 46 of those slides and show you one that summarizes what we learned, that in, in our last Contented Cow analysis, the companies we looked at, again, with a great reputation, but also the leadership that it takes to sustain that reputation, their stock return beat the Standard & Poor's by nearly 10%. They provided for their owners and investors an average wealth premium of $70 billion per year. And in a period of time when the U.S. economy was growing at less than 3%, these companies grew by 23.4%. Saying to me that I think there is a strong correlation between organizations with the kind of strategy that I'm talking about and their bottom line results. Contented cows give better milk. One of the, one of the uh, data points that we looked at, of course, was employee turnover something that's going to, that has always been of importance to you, but as you continue to grow, it's going to become of more and more greater and greater importance. Turnover, employee turnover. There are a lot of industries in our country that have historically, traditionally, high turnover, high employee turnover. I put a few of them on the screen, but in each case, I can show you a specific employer who has a strategy around employee engagement and leadership who does much, much better with respect to employee turnover. I won't go through all of these, but I will a couple. Uh, for instance, Wegmans. How many of you live in the northeast part of the U.S. where Wegmans is a force? All right. So you know that Wegmans is a little bit different from a lot of supermarkets. 86% is the employee turnover rate nationwide in supermarkets on average. But at Weg Wegmans, it's 6%. They have to be doing something differently. But my favorite example that I showed on the screen a moment ago is that of fast food. Look at that. 300% employee turnover in the fast food business. Can you, I mean, think about that. 
You, you drive up to window number one to order your hamburger and fries, right, from a person. By the time you get over to window number two to pick them up, the person you ordered them from has already initiated a career change. Now, how do you manage a group of people that turns over three times a year? Let's ask the folks at Chick-fil-A. For whatever else you may think of Chick-fil-A, they're doing something right when it comes not only to customer service, but to employee engagement and turnover. 65% in an industry that generally experiences 300. So just to summarize the benefits that we have seen of what we call a contented cow strategy, these organizations, and it is a strategy, it's not an afterthought, they grow faster. They're more productive and more profitable. They have increased employee engagement and therefore much lower employee turnover. They recruit more talented employees and they create more wealth for their owners. Anyone in this room object to any of those points? Would you not want to have any of those things in your sport clips business? Right. So I think we have to ask the question, what is it behaviorally that, how can we link what we've seen in terms of employee engagement to actual financial benefits. I think a lot of it comes from something called discretionary effort. Discretionary effort. Discretionary effort is a, it's a psychological term that was uh, coined about 80 years ago by an industrial psychologist who defined discretionary effort as that increment of human effort, the expenditure of which is solely at the discretion of the worker. That increment of human effort, the expenditure of which is solely at the discretion of the worker, which is just a fancy way of saying it's what we do because we want to, not because we have to. I've expressed it mathematically on the screen as, as the difference between that of which we are capable and that which is required of us to do our jobs. See this gap, folks? This gap is discretionary effort, and it is this gap that we as leaders, that each of you as an area developer, as a team leader, that each of your managers in your stores must tap into if your goal is recruitment, retention, and earning a profit based on your people practices. Because this gap, this discretionary effort, this is the most profitable morsel of human effort that your team members can offer you. Because you can't pay for it. You can't benefit it out of people. You can't beat it out of people. You can only lead and inspire it out of people. And when you do, you'll have an organization that is absolutely firing on every cylinder imaginable. People who are loyal to your organization, loyal to your clients, and help who help you make more money because they're there for the long term. I think the term discretionary effort is a fine term, but it's a little clinical for me, and so I, I really prefer the synonym of oomph. Oomph, people who work with discretionary effort on a regular basis. You know who these people are. You have them. Each of you has them in your areas. Most of you have them in your stores. It's that person who works, who does more than they have to. And that's the kind of person that you need to fill your stores with. That's who you're looking for in your recruiting efforts. That's who you're looking to keep. That's who you're looking to keep. People who work with oomph, people I call extra milers. Extra milers are like the, the, the stylist that I heard of in one of your stores in Chicago. She was, she, was work, she was between clients at that moment, and she saw another client driving into the parking lot who was a regular client of another stylist who was sitting in the chair, working in the chair next to her, and who was working on a client at that moment. This person happened to get around in a scooter, uh, like a Gordon Mobile, very much like the, like the scooter that Gordon is in temporarily, but I think this client, was, this is how he got around all the time. He was having some struggles getting into the building. This stylist saw that, put down what she was doing. She wasn't working with the client. Put down everything she was doing, just ran over, opened the door, helped this person. And it wasn't her client, and she knew that. She knew he was coming in to see the stylist next to her. That's an extra miler. Extra milers are people who, who, ask for over, who ask for more time. They want to be at work. They want to be there. They go over and above. They go above and beyond in service of your clients. That's who you want working in your stores. That's the type of person that you're looking to recruit 
and the kind of people that you're looking to retain. One of the things that we know about employee engagement is that while work is contractual, engagement is deeply personal. Work is contractual, but engagement is based on a personal relationship between that stylist and his or her. It's just usually going to be her. Can I just say her? <laughs> between the stylist and her manager. Between the manager and her uh, team leader. Between the team leader and his or her area developer and the entire support system here at Sport Clips. You cannot write employee engagement into a business agreement. You can't write it into a labor contract. You can't write it into a job description. You can only lead and inspire it from people. And again, when you do, you'll have a group of people who stays. And it's not just about staying. It's about staying and doing their very best work. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to do some research, some field research at Wegmans. And so I, I went up to Syracuse, New York, where I met Philip O'Myra. Philip O'Myra, as you can see from the slide, is a sushi chef in one of Wegmans stores in upstate New York. My idea was because in 2006, Wegmans had been named by Fortune magazine as the very best place to work in the United States of America. A supermarket, folks. Best place to work in the country. So I wanted to find out what is it that's going on at Wegmans that makes this such an engaging and such an amazing place to work. So I had an appointment with the store manager for about an hour's tour of the store that day. But before I went in, I figured, you know, they probably said this guy's coming in, some author guy from Florida, and, and he's going to come in, so let's all be on our best behavior. So I wanted to come in and kind of see what it was like to be a customer at Wegmans before, I had a, before they knew kind of who, who was coming in or that I, somebody was coming in. So I got there a little bit early, and, and I went up to someone. Here's what I wanted to do. Here was my plan, and it worked beautifully. I wanted to find someone whom I would describe as an extra miler, and my test for this was to find someone in the store who could pass what I consider to be the ultimate test of customer service commitment and store knowledge in a supermarket. Now, do you know what I consider to be the ultimate test of customer service commitment and store knowledge in a supermarket? It is to ask someone where I can find the canned fried onion rings. Now, I know why some of you are laughing, because you don't know where to find the canned fried onion rings either, do you? Nobody does. Some of you are saying, what is this man talking about? And others of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you know that canned fried onion rings were developed by food scientists many decades ago for one purpose on earth and one purpose alone, and that is what? To rest atop green bean casserole. In fact, where I come from in Florida, it is said that you would sooner make a green bean casserole without the green beans than without the fried onion rings. These items, by the way, these are things that are indigenous to church suppers and other things uh, that, that we do, especially in the South. But all over the country, people eat green bean casserole. So, so I went up to this man. You'll notice he has a very sharp knife in his hand. I went up to him, and I interrupted his slow of work, and I said, can you tell me where I could find the green, the, not the green bean casserole, where I could find the canned fried onion rings? With great flourish and delight, he took off his plastic gloves and he said, yes, sir, I know exactly where they are. Come with me. And we went over about 15 aisles. This is a huge store. We went, and without so much as even consulting a store directory, he knew exactly where they were. And he got down on the bottom shelf. These things get no respect. And he, he said, how many would you like? I said, one. 79 cents. About a cent and a half to the bottom line. I thanked him kindly, and on the way back to, where, to his workstation, he said, have you ever been in our store before? And I said, no, I'll tell you, I've never actually been in a Wegmans at all. He said, well, here, let me show you over here to our Alaska King Crab Legs uh, display, and we have a special tasting over here. You're not allergic to seafood now, are you? No, okay, well, here, would you like to have a tasting of this? And, oh, let me tell you over here, we have a, another, we have a tasting of gourmet olive oils, artisanal olive oils. And he invited me to do, this man was like, he was like the CEO of, of Wegmans. I looked to see if his name was Wegmans, but it wasn't. 
It was Omira. And I thanked him kindly. I was amazed at the kind of how he, he was really into it. You know, uh, in fact, that's one of my definitions of employee engagement. People say, what is employee engagement? It's a measure of how into it you are in your job. How into it. And you've got people who are really into it. You've also seen people who are really out of it. You want the ones who were into it. Philip O'Meara was into it. I thanked him kindly. I went out of the store. I did not have the heart to put back the can of onion. I actually bought them. I was staying with some friends that night in Syracuse. I'm sure they made a dandy uh, casserole with them. But I, I came back about an hour later for my real tour, and I asked the store manager if he could introduce me to someone he would describe as an extra miler. He said, I have a lot of them in this store, but one who comes to mind immediately is our sushi chef, Philip. <laughs> so he took me back there, and Philip looked at me as if to say, oh, you again. And I told him why I was there. And, and he, I said, you know, Philip, your manager has singled you out as an extra miler. I've been on the receiving end of this. I've seen it. Why are you so into Wegmans? Why are you so into what you do? And how long have you been here? He said, I've been here for more than 15 years. He said, I'll tell you why I'm here and why I stay here and why I hope I never have to leave. He told me a little bit of his story, that he had come to the United States from the Philippines as soon as he graduated from high school at age 18 with six of his seven siblings. They had all immigrated to the U.S. One sister, his eldest sister, remained in the Philippines. Twenty-five years later, after he had moved from Cherry Hill, New Jersey, which is where the rest of the brothers and sisters were, up to Syracuse, New York, his sister in the Philippines announced she was coming to the United States for an extended visit, three months. She had never been to the United States, and they had never been back to the Philippines in the 25 years that they had been away. He was trying to figure out how he could combine his vacation and his paid time off and, 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 and get you know days maybe without pay and weekends and holidays and all of this stuff so he could have a long, contiguous period down there in Cherry Hill, six-hour drive. He didn't want to be driving back and forth, but he wanted to spend as much time as he could with the sister whom he hadn't seen in 25 years. His manager found out about the situation and said, wait a minute, Philip. We have a store in Cherry Hill. Why don't we just plug you in down there for about three months? How would you like that? He said, because they do for me what they didn't have to do. I do for them maybe some things that I don't have to do. You see, when you give to that degree, you always receive in greater measure. I'll tell you, I looked that afternoon all through their employee handbook, and I can tell you with, with a great deal of certainty, there's nothing in their employee handbook that says to their managers, if you have an employee who has a long lost sister who's coming to the United States after 25 years and they haven't seen him, you have to reassign that person and relocate him to a store in the area where she's going to be for three months. It doesn't say anything like that. Work is contractual, but oh, engagement is deeply personal. And it is personal in your Sport Clips stores as well. One thing that's very different today from maybe when many of us began working is that job tenure in the United States has gone down just about the opposite. These, Gordon, these charts look about the opposite of your charts before that were all going up as time went by, and that's great. This chart goes down. 1950, people stayed on the job an average of 19 years. Today, closer to four years. So I don't think we can expect for people to stay with our organization forever and ever and ever. But we got to do better than four years. We got to do better than four months. We got to do better than four weeks, don't we? And we've got to do better at recruiting the very best to stay for a while. This whole four year thing was not really too surprising to me when I, I spoke to a friend of mine. He's about, he's 35 years old and he's in the high end restaurant business. He's been with seven different national restaurant companies in his career since he graduated from high school 17 years ago. Seven different companies, seven years. I said, Will, what's the deal with the seven employers in seven years? He said, Richard, we don't marry our jobs. We're just dating. We don't marry our jobs. We're just dating. And you know what? Maybe that's the reality of today's workforce. And if it is, I want to challenge you to make that dating experience the very best dating experience any of your stylists ever had. And you know what? It may turn into a much longer term relationship. 
When we look at what it takes to engage employees and engage them for the long term, there are five things that we find people want. Number one, people want meaningful work. They want to know that, know that what they do makes a difference, that what they do matters, and that someone notices it. They want caring, authentic leadership. They want autonomy. Give me the tools and the wherewithal and the training and the preparation to do my very best work and then get out of my face and let me do it. People want the opportunity to grow and develop, which does not necessarily equate to promotion in today's economy and in today's world of work. And it will be no revelation to you that people want appreciation. I had the opportunity to visit many of your stores, several in the Chicago area, and one in my hometown of Jacksonville, Florida. I saw some great examples of appreciation in really all of these things where I was. Here is your goal, I believe, as a team leader, as an area developer, in terms of recruiting, but also especially retaining the very best stylists to work in your stores. Because no matter what kind of an environment you create, people will always be tempted to look somewhere else, occasionally. When they do, you want them to look up in the corner, just as you see this woman on the screen now. You want them to look up in the corner of their field of vision and say, if I were to leave sport clips and go over there, I wonder if I'd be able to replicate what I've got here. I wonder if I'd be able to replicate what I've got here. And what I've got is going to be the intangibles. They're going to know what the salary is going to be. They're going to know what the pay deal is. They'll know what the benefits deal is. That's not what I'm talking about. Will I be able to replicate the caring leadership, the trust, the feeling that I'm doing important work, the feeling of working with competent team members, the feeling of working with a manager who cares about my development and about me personally. You want them to think that every time they consider going somewhere else, and you want the answer to be, probably not. Probably not. When we looked at contented cow organizations, we found three things that they all had in common. Number one, their people were truly committed, truly committed to the organization. and committed to some person, an anchor in their organization, in your case, generally, that store manager. Committed. It starts with the hiring process. We need to hire people who have the potential to commit to working for sport clips, to being stylists in your stores. We need to hire people who have the potential to be happy, productive, and successful working for you. So your next assignment says hire for fit. I know that you have to hire people who, have, who are licensed and who are certified and who have the education, but that is a minimum requirement. Not everybody should get to work at sport clips. Contented cow companies are great places to work, but they're not necessarily easy places to work, and they're clearly not for everybody. If you want to recruit the best and retain the best, you'll create a reputation as an organization that not everybody gets to work here, only the best, and only people who fit here by nature of, by virtue of their nature, by virtue of a whole lot of intangible elements that your managers can see when they hire. I want you to use the tools that Sport Clips, that Julie was talking about earlier, use the tools that help you to hire the very best people, but above all, hire people who fit at Sport Clips. Southwest Airlines does a particularly good job of a lot of things. You're going to hear more from Jason Young uh, tomorrow. Uh, you, many of you have heard Jason before. Jason has, uh, was once uh, in uh, worked for Southwest in their training uh, division at Southwest. And he's going to tell you a lot more about Southwest than I will be able to tell you. But one thing that I know in talking with the folks at Southwest is that they do a great job of hiring for fit. Here's one of their recruiting ads. which says to me pretty clearly that if you're going to be happy, productive, and successful working at Southwest, you have to have a pretty good sense of humor. But seriously, the folks at Southwest have told me 
What they're looking for in their customer contact employees are people who listen, smile, care, and say thank you. Pretty simple, right? Now, they do have a few other requirements, like for their pilots and their mechanics and things like that, okay? But for their customer contact folks, this is what they're looking for. Here's the thing, folks. I don't know. And this is probably a pretty good list for you. I, I don't know what your list of what I call non-technical fit requirements would be. I don't really care what it is because I'm not qualified to know, but you are. And so what I do care a lot about is that you know what this list would look like for you, that you could articulate those requirements with the degree of clarity that you saw on that list and that you would hire with great discipline around whatever those non-technical fit requirements are. And so I would encourage you to get together and to say, let's establish, let's identify, let's articulate what this would be at Sport Clips and then hire people with those qualities. Bill Marriott said it's more, I know we're staying at a Hilton, but let's, uh, <laughs> Bill Marriott said it's more important to hire people with the right qualities than with specific experience. Nowhere is that truer than in your business. When I was in Chicago, I went into one of the stores there and I saw right away that someone got that. Someone understood how important it was to hire people with the right qualities. When I saw this group of young women standing here as I walked in and they said, welcome to Sport Clips, I didn't know at that point or even really care how well they cut hair. I knew that I was in a place that I wanted to be because right from the very first part of that five-point play, the kickoff, I knew that I was in a place that I wanted to be. Somebody has done a good job of hiring for fit. But I also met my stylist in another one of the stores in, uh, in Chicago who cut my hair, Kaylee in Chicago who cut my hair. She did a great job, don't you think? Uh, actually, this is not a Kaylee haircut. This was the foundation of a haircut that I got later from Joanne Chapman in Jacksonville, and I'll tell you about that one later. My hair grows really fast. Good for, I know you like people like me, right? Yeah, my hair grows really fast. But Kaylee cut my hair, and after she was finished, she put something in it, and my hair had never looked so good. And so she sold me a little cat. No, she didn't. She didn't sell me anything. She told me about what she put in my hair. She told me about this little canister, little green canister called Forming Cream by American Crew. I didn't know that what was wrong with my hair was it needed to be formed, but it did. And when I saw my hair and felt it and I went out, it was, John, it was about 150 degrees below zero in Chicago that day with 150 mile an hour winds. I'm sure that's what it was. When I walked outside, my hair didn't move a bit. I said, I got to have me some of this, and I got me some. Well, when I came here to Houston, I was all excited because I've been using this forming cream now for all these weeks. And people stop me on the street and say, wow. Look how that man's hair is formed. And so I got here, and this morning I was getting all ready, and I washed my hair, and I blew dry it and all this, and I went to get my forming cream. And it was nowhere to be found. Now, I don't know where my forming cream is, but I do have a 21-year-old son at home, so I know where to start looking. <laughs> well, the folks at American Crew here in the model prep room saved the day. I walked in there. I said, I understand this is the model prep room. I said, I'm not a model, but I am a speaker, and I need prep. <laughs> they had the little green canister of forming cream, and the guy named Ange, who was over there, put it in my hair, and this is what you get. So anyway, I'm pretty happy with it. I hope you are. But Kaylee, Kaylee is somebody who not only was hired because she's a great hair cutter, she had no difficulty. She did, it was so smooth. I said, Kaylee, what is that you put in my hair? She said, oh, that? And she had, and I mean, that's all she had to do. I, how many can I get from you? How many have you got? You know, how many will TSA let me bring back when I go back? Now, the reason I like this stuff in my hair is because it makes my hair a little, a little sticky. That's what you're trying to do in your stores. 
You want to make the environment of your stores a little sticky. So people, not only your clients, but your stylists will want to come and stay and stick around for a long time to come. So here's another assignment, and that is on a stylist's first day, well, you got to go all out. You got to go out, go all out. Your five-point play starts with the kickoff, and you know how important that is to greet the customer when they walk in. How much more important is it? Because guys get their hair cut, what, on average 10, 12 times a year? I do. How often do you start a new job? If it's 10, 12 times a year, we have a problem. When you start a new job, that's a big deal. Many of you, you own your own businesses. You don't remember necessarily what it's like to start a job. It's been a while since you did that. When you start a job, it's a big deal. You have in, in all of your sport clips information, uh, something called a red carpet welcome. Boy, I want to encourage you if you're not doing that, and I suspect some aren't. I want to encourage you to think about how can you go all out on that first day? A company that we've worked with in Cincinnati, CMH, CHS Healthcare. It's a, it's a, a, a company that employs uh, home health uh, aides to go into people's homes and take care of, of people. On the first day, that, and it's a very, very difficult field in which to attract and retain people, but I tell you what, they've cracked the code on that. On, a, on a, a nurse assistant's first day in that company, before they even come, they get a letter from the president, the CEO of the company, welcoming them. They get a phone call from the manager of the branch where they're going to be working, saying, I am so excited that you're coming to work with us. We can't wait for you to get here. We really need you. When they get there on that first day, there's a big poster in the break room with their name on it that all of the other employees in the branch have already signed. If the person's name is Kathy, Kathy, welcome. We're so glad you're here. When they get, they are absolutely blown away. I don't know what you're doing on a stylist's first day, but I want you to blow them away. When you do, they're going to again raise their eyes toward the ceiling and say, I wonder if I were to ever leave. I wonder if I'd ever get a welcome like that. You want them to go home on that first day and, and to say to their husband or their boyfriend or their parents or their kids or whoever their family is, you won't believe how I was welcomed today at Sport Clips. This is a place I see staying for a long, long time. First day, go all out. But you've also got to define your mission at the store level and at the company level in very clear and compelling terms. And I'll tell you what, it's a lot more than a mission statement. You've got an excellent mission statement. What we need to do is to build a sense of mission. Where do people get, where do your stylists get the sense of mission? Who do they get it from? They better get it from you and from the managers in your stores. Uh, earlier, uh, well, last year, uh, my family and I were, were visiting in Edinburgh, Scotland. My wife was born in Scotland, born and raised there and lived there until she was an adult, and all of her family is still there. So because we have a free place to stay, we go there as often as we can. And we were, we were walking around in the center city of Edinburgh, and we came across this sign. And the reason I took a picture of it is because I thought, why do these people need a sign? Here's the thing, your folks are not clairvoyant. <laughs> Apparently neither are they. But your folks are not clairvoyant. They need to hear it from you, the leaders. What is our mission? As I said, it's not about a mission statement. If you do need a new mission statement, I can recommend a book. It's called The Mission Statement Book, 301 Corporate Mission Statements from America's Top Company, 1795. And in this book, all you have to do, if you, if you should ever need a new mission statement, like I said, you've got a great one, but if you should ever need to change your mission statement, just open it up, change a few words, find one you like, change a few words, and presto change there, you got yourself a mission statement. Here's my favorite one in the entire book. It says our mission is to maximize shareholder value, satisfy our customers' needs while providing our employees a rewarding and productive work environment, conducting our responsibility in the community. We will accomplish this mission by creating a corporate vision of successful growth by carefully managing our assets and by integrating our business through effective planning and allocation of resources. Well, I'm pumped. <laughs> what does this mean? What do these people even do? I mentioned a little earlier Chick-fil-A. They just take a little different view of this whole thing. <laughs> now, do this for me. Those of you who wear glasses, pretend you're at the eye doctor for your annual eye exam. Which is clearer? A. 
or B. <laughs> so it just doesn't have to be that difficult or that complicated, but it does have to come from the heart. And so I love your, I love your mission statement that says, to create a championship haircut experience for men and boys in an exciting sports environment. That I can understand. That I can get around. Now, your job is to make sure people see that, that you live that mission every day. Because as Charlie Parker, the jazz saxophonist, once said about music, if you don't live it, it won't come out of your horn. If you don't live it, it won't come out of your horn. So the question is, what is coming out of your horn as you work with your store managers in terms of your mission? I've got an assignment for that, and this is one each of you can do, and I really want you to do it. When you get back, I want you to ask every manager, every team member, what are our top three business priorities? Because if you ask six people for three priorities and you get 18 priorities among them, you could have a hard-working group of very well-meaning people working on so many priorities that nothing reaches critical mass. But if you ask six people for three priorities and you hear the same three priorities from all of them, I can show you an organization that is focused Focused on the client, focused on the business, focused on what it takes to get it done. I want you to check for consistency. Ask yourself that question first. Ask Gordon that question and see what kind of consistency you have. And when you've brought it down to three priorities that everyone knows, then you'll be able to engage and retain people at the level that you need. The second thing we learned about contented cow companies is that their people are enabled to do their best, best work. We've all heard this word for the last 25 years in the business world, not enabled, but empowered. I essentially mean the same thing. I'm just a little tired of the word empowered. Is anybody with me on that? I've just heard it way too much. It's been abused and misused and abused. Um, uh, I checked into a hotel uh, not too long ago, and the woman behind the registration desk was wearing a great big lapel pin on her uniform. It was like the size of a salad plate. <laughs> and it said, I'm empowered. <laughs> so I asked her, I said, so what does the button mean? She said, oh, that? I don't know. They just told me to wear it. <laughs> now think about it. The woman's not even empowered to, like, accessorize her outfit much less to serve customers. So let's don't worry about empowering people, but let's enable them to do their best work. We enable them with leadership traits, such as the ones you see on the screen, honesty and integrity, compassion, optimism, communication, especially the listening part, decisiveness, and what I call reflection and improvability. Can I take a few moments to reflect and to, to introspect a little bit about my leadership abilities, and am I open to the possibility that I can be a better leader? When your team members, when your managers see this in you, then they can become engaged in sport clips. So here's your assignment. I want you to take one of those traits that I just put on the screen. Can we go back to that slide for just a moment, please? Thank you. To those traits. And, and again, this is in the download that you can go online and get. Contentacals.com slash sport clips. Take a look at that list. And now we, yeah, now I can control the next one. And I want you to pick one and just resolve to get better at it over the next 90 days. Then I want you to give that assignment to each of the managers in your stores. When they focus on things like that, you'll see a difference. People know that their work has to matter. A number of years ago, I was working on a consulting project in a company, a factory that made hospital products like the bag and tube assemblies you see on the screen. They were having all kinds of trouble with turnover, retention, and poor quality, and disengagement. And, and I went in and I asked people, I said, so tell me what you do in your job. And they said, well, we take a piece of plastic and we stick it in an adhesive and we stick it in a bag and we push all the air. They had to revive me three times while they were telling me the story. No wonder they were disengaged. I put them on a big fat school bus and took them down to the closest hospital where the stuff was actually being used. And they saw those products in the arms of patients saving lives and healing unbearable pain. And they said, now we know why we do what we do. That's what it takes. People need to understand how their work matters. The moment your stylists begin to think that all they do is cut guys' hair, they can't possibly be engaged to the level that, they need, that you need them to be. I'm going to go back to the... I'm going to ask you to go back to the other slide uh, quickly, jump the gun on that. 
A few years ago, I was working, uh, doing a, a seminar in a much smaller venue than this. We were expecting about 150 people in the room. And I had sent the meeting planner ahead of time how I needed the room set up. When I got there the next day, I was kind of stumbled out of bed about 6 o'clock in the morning, came downstairs looking pretty rough, opened up the door to see if the room was set up the way I needed it to, and it was set up the way I needed it uh, to, but uh, according to the wrong instructions. My fault, not theirs. I had simply sent them the wrong instructions. So I needed to get a lot of things changed in a very short period of time. So I was looking for a woman, I was looking for somebody who maybe had a Marriott name tag. We were staying at the Marriott Suites at Dulles Airport outside of Washington, D.C. There was a woman standing at the end of the hall putting out coffee and breakfast rolls, and she came up to me and she saw that I was in some distress, and she said, can I help you? I said, I sure hope so. I said, I've really blown it. I've sent the wrong instructions, and I need 150 chairs and tables and table skirts and staging and lighting and audiovisual equipment, and all I got is 35 chairs and a cute little circle in the middle of the room. She said, well, do you have the right instructions now? She was a little sassy, but, you know, I didn't have, you know, I couldn't really argue. I told her, yes, I did. And, and she looked at those specifications, and she looked at that room, and she said, yeah, I can take care of that. I said, well, I appreciate that, but I'm not sure you understand exactly what I need. You see, I need 115 more chairs and tables and table skirts and stages and staging and lighting and audiovisual equipment and all this in about an hour and 10 minutes. She said, I can take care of that. I started to protest again, and she looked up at me and she said, and you'll appreciate this, she said, sir, you need to go upstairs and do something with your hair. <laughs> and she was right. And so I went upstairs, and I got ready, and I came back about 45 minutes later. I want you to know that room was well on its way to being set up exactly as I needed. I said to her, you have created a miracle. She said, she handed me her business card. Look at that. Annie Chow, banquet server. A banquet server with a business card. A cold embossed business card. She said, sir, these rooms are my responsibility. What happens in here is a direct reflection on me. Wow. Well, you know what? Each of your stylists is an artist. Expressing her creativity and her canvas is a man's head. Every man who walks out of your store walks out carrying the artwork of your stylist. If your stylist begins to believe that all she's doing is cutting a man's hair and doesn't understand that she's sending a canvas out into the world showing people the work that she can do, then she's missed the point. So the question is, is that canvas walking out of your store looking like that? or like that. That was actually me before the forming cream, you understand, but no. There's something else. Cutting a man's hair is very important, but letting him go out with her artistry on his head is even more so, and even perhaps in some cases more than that, is what your stylists do when a man comes in, he's had a rough day, he's having some hard times in his life, not financially maybe, but in other ways, and, and he's just plain grumpy. And when she can talk to him and explain to him and show him that she cares about him as a person, as a client, and can brighten his day, even in some small way, she has done something that most people never have the opportunity to do in their work. Make sure your stylists know all that they do and how their work matters. It matters that they work for a company that supports something like the Veterans of Foreign War in your Help a Hero program. To talk about that, to capitalize on that, when they see that, they'll know the meaningfulness of what they do. But I love what Peter Drucker, late great management guru, once said, 90% of what we call management consists of making it difficult for people to get things done. I'm guilty, anyone else? So I want to encourage you to go back, and if you really want to enable people to do their best work, I want you to fix one utterly stupid policy, rule, procedure, or system in your organization that hampers the flawless execution of your mission. And you got one. You may not be able to think of what it is, but you've got one. Something that's under your control. I don't want you to go back and mess with anyone else's utterly stupid policy, procedure, rule, system, or habit. Find one of your own, change it, and free up your team members to do their best work. If you can't think of anything, just ask your team members. 
they'll be able to help you a lot with that one. Lastly we, know, lastly, we know that in contented cow organizations, their people are cared about. You have three big questions that you ask here at Sport Clips. Can I trust you? Are you committed to excellence? And thirdly, do you care about me? That's our third question as well. Because we know that people simply reserve their best effort for a leader who cares. What does that mean? It means you say thank you a lot. You do it in a lot of different ways. I learned from Joanne Chapman, the manager of the store on Atlantic Boulevard in Jacksonville, Florida, about five minutes from my home. And she was my stylist on that day. She said, you know, Richard, if you hire the right people and then you never let them feel like they're being taken for granted, you never let them forget how much you appreciate them, he said, she said, that's the biggest part of the challenge. Joanne and another company received the national award for the best retention of stylists in the entire company. So you know what? While I very much appreciate the opportunity to come up and tell you what I think you ought to do to retain people, you've got experts all over the country and now in Canada who know how to do it. And so I want to encourage you to do what things that, that Joanne has done. And for instance, in, in this case, uh, this is uh, something, it's Easter time, and so they're having a promotion about uh, back bar percent, and when you do what you're supposed to do, then your name gets in a basket and you get Easter. I didn't understand how it all worked, but it doesn't matter if I understand it. The point is she's being creative. She's using some things that speak to the people in her organization, in her, in her store. But here's your assignment. Ask the experts. Find out who's doing the best job of retaining stylists and ask them what they do. You'll learn everything you need to know. Because Napoleon Bonaparte once said, a man will fight long and hard for a bit of colored ribbon. It doesn't take much. And as Mark Twain said, I can live for two weeks on a good compliment. So much of the retention game has to do with showing people <clears throat> that you appreciate them and that you appreciate their contribution. But here's the thing, when it comes to appreciation, one size does not fit all. One size fits one. I have a list here of 11 questions. I'm not going to ask you to read these. I'm not going to read them to you. I don't expect you to remember them, but they're on the download. These are things that, you can, that I think you need to know the answer to for every one of your team members, many without even asking. Only when you know the answers to those questions will you be in a position to know how you can reward them in meaningful ways. One way that you need to reward your managers is by turn, for turning stylists into leaders. It's not just about how well they run the store. It's not just about how well they cut the hair. It is that, and it is also for turning stylists into leaders, for making those stylists from leaders to legends. Reward them for that. Here's a whole list of things that you can do. Write handwritten thank you notes when people do a great job. Use your sharp cards that have been provided to you. Capitalize on the pep rallies. Really use those pep rallies to tell people what a great job they're doing. Other things you can do, flexible hours, surprise time off with pay. What I call a Friday blowout. And Friday may not be the best day in all of your stores, but we went to visit Zappos headquarters in Las Vegas. When you go to your meeting next year, I would encourage you to do that if you have a little extra time. And, they were having a Friday blowout to express appreciation to all of their team leaders. Now, their Friday blowout involved jello shots. I'm not suggesting that that's what you need to do, but that's what they did there. Friday blowouts. Include families. If, some, if one of your team members, if their family member does something great in the community, recognize that. Celebrate that. Be creative. Give thoughtful gifts. If you see someone coming into your store every day to work with a Starbucks cup and you want to reward them, give them a Starbucks card. You've already got the information to do that. In one company where we've done some work, there was a, a team member who was having a hard time. Suddenly, she became disengaged in her work. We found out the problem was she had a, a son, a young son, who was suddenly doing very poorly in school. That was distracting her. Her manager paid for a tutor to tutor that child. Suddenly, his employee was back at full engagement.
Sponsor a nonprofit that's, that's important to them. You do great work, certainly with your veterans program. But if you're also giving to other charities, find out what charities are important to the team members in your store. And if you're going to be making contributions, make it to those that are important to your team members. Managers, volunteer to wash all of your team members' cars one day. Boy, they'll never leave if they, find, if they say, wow, my manager's going to wash my car every now and then. Volunteer to do their least favorite job for one day. Again, it's all about asking the question, would I get this anywhere else? If you care, you sit on the footlocker, which means you spend time. And I know that you all spend time in the stores, team leaders and area developers. But let me say this, <laughs> when you're in the store, be of value. <laughs> Don't just be there and have people say, oh gosh, I wish they weren't here. I wish they weren't coming in today. Don't be just of ornamental value, be of utilitarian value. If you don't come out of that store every time you visit and have the team members say, I'm so glad my team leader came in, I'm so glad my area developer came in, they were really helpful today, then you've not done everything you can do to engage people. The last thing that I want to say is that if you care, you feed your troops first. I had the opportunity in writing this most recent book to visit the Plantronics headset factory in Tijuana, Mexico. Alejandro Bustamante is the CEO of Plamex, the Mexican division of Plantronics. And he is a legendary leader. When he first came to Plantronics 15 years ago, he encountered a disaffected, disengaged workforce, high error rates, low quality, at a time when they needed their production to be as high as it possibly could. 2,500 employees working in this factory, many of them young, single people. He learned that at that time, Mexican law stipulated that if you were wanted to get married and get a marriage license, you had to get your original birth certificate, which you could only get by going to the town of your birth and picking it up in person. 80% of his workforce works outside, comes from outside of Tijuana in the interior of Mexico. They simply couldn't do it for practical reasons. So what were they doing? They were living together. They were having children without marriage. And if you know anything about the faith and culture in that part of the world, that's a problem. It's especially a problem for the children born of those relationships who are shunned and who are ridiculed when they go to school and go out into the community. And so Alejandro said, I can't fix everything here, but one thing I can do is show how much I care about each of my team members. And he said, if anybody wants to go home and get their birth certificate, take a week with pay, it won't count against your vacation. I'm gonna trust you that that's what you're really doing, that you're not taking undue advantage of the situation. So many people did it that first year, 15 years ago, that when they came back, he said, let's just throw a group wedding right here in the factory. He said, we have a great dining facility, people can make cakes, we have people who can sing, I'll hire a judge, he'll do 24 weddings for the price of one, we'll make it a big celebration. At the end of that first wedding, two teenagers, a brother and sister, came up to him with tears in their eyes and said, Senor Bustamante, you have no idea what this is going to do for us when we go back to school. Our parents are now married. He said he knew after that first time this is something they would continue to do forever and ever. And so every year on the Saturday closest to Valentine's Day, they have a big mass wedding at the Plantronics factory in Tijuana, Mexico. Now that puts a whole new spin on employee engagement, doesn't it? Am I suggesting that you should hold employee mass employee weddings in your stores? No, not for a moment. But I do want to remind you of something I said earlier, that while work is contractual, engagement is deeply personal. And that is because while reputation recruits, leadership retains. Contented cows do give better milk, and if you will apply that, you will all go from being leaders to legends. Thank you.